What is up y'all, Scott here. Today we are doing part two of the deep dive into the raw mountain bike edit changing seasons. If you didn't see part one yet, we got into how I went about editing that project and just some of the thinking that went into putting it together. This time we're going to be talking about sound design and color grading specifically. So hopefully this one will come in as a little bit of a shorter video. We're gonna be a little bit more specific, but it's still gonna be a longer one. So I hope you'll stick with me until the end. Before we get started, I just wanna say thank you to everybody who has been stoked on this project, all the new people that have joined the channel. Um, all that support is really just felt and I just wanna make sure you all know how much I appreciate it um, that you're following along and are interested in what I'm working on. But let's get into this process. We're gonna start off by looking at sound. So let's jump over to the computer and we'll start walking through my Premiere setup and some of the things that I'm thinking about with different sound design elements when I'm working on a raw edit. When capturing audio for this project, there were three main methods we employed. The first one was your standard on-camera microphone. So when the rider is within five to 10 feet of where the camera is, this type of audio works quite well. As they get further away from the camera, you start not having quite as high quality audio when you're using that on-camera source. And so in this case, we would switch over to a trail side microphone. And this was usually recorded after we had the video clip already captured. I'd have the rider ride the, the same section of trail again in the same way. And this time I would stand right next to the trail or position the microphone right next to the trail and get really good audio as close as possible to that audio source. And then we can make adjustments in post to make it feel like it fits that clip more appropriately. And then the third way that we captured audio was for the longer cable camera shots. And this particular method that we used is something we just kind of came up with and in the end it worked out pretty well. And we taped a microphone onto the bike and it actually followed along with the rider the entire way. Everything that we captured in the video was done with the Sennheiser MKE 600 microphone. This is a shotgun mic that captures a mono audio signal. A bit of what we captured was done with the Rode Video Micro um, for a few of the on-camera microphone shots, but in general, I tried to keep everything on the Sennheiser. And this was just to have a similar frequency pickup for the microphone. Different mics will interpret sound differently, and I just wanted to make sure we're, we were in the same environment for all the different clips we were capturing. Once we had all that stuff captured and we dropped it into the footage, it was a matter of just getting it synced up. And this was by relying on uh, a jump feature or some particular notable feature in the video clip that I could correlate with a clip in the audio so that we could get those things to line up. And it just takes a little bit of playing around to get things to work perfectly. Now, once you have everything in the edit, there's three main things that I look at when I'm trying to make the audio feel more real and believable. First one is volume, second one is panning, and then the third one is EQing and just trying to get that audio to sit in the environment. So let's take a look at those steps piece by piece and I'll show you how I worked on that in the edit. The first thing that we look at is volume. I go across the entire edit and I'm looking at every single clip that I've got in here and making sure they all sort of sit right um, in relationship to one another. If you're closer to the microphone, that audio source is probably gonna be louder. Maybe if you recorded it with a different device, you're gonna have different levels on that. So I go through everything. If you click on a clip and then you hit the G key, it brings up the audio gain and you can adjust that up and down to make sure that it's sitting um, at the same place as all the clips in, in the whole sequence. And some things you're gonna naturally want them to be a bit quieter and so you can kind of take that into account right at this point. Once I've got everything roughly figured out, I'm going in and I'm actually drawing these keyframes for different parts of the clip to make audio ramp in or get louder, get quieter as the rider is moving further or closer to the camera. So one great example here is this longer clip it's a cable camera shot. So the rider's starting quite far away from the camera and then they approach and they're closer and then again they move further away. And so you can watch this right here where you can see the audio keyframes for this section. So there you go, the, the rider is closest to the camera here and so we have the audio loudest at this point. And you can see there was a little bit of clipping there. It's not terrible. I could have probably done that slightly better. I'm trying to get my audio to all sit around negative four, negative three dB so it 
feels like every other video that you're watching. So that's the biggest thing with audio is just making it rise and fall with the distance that the rider is from the camera itself. This piece of audio was captured on the bike and so all of that adjustment in sound is happening in post. It was all the same volume coming out of the microphone. After I've got my audio all dialed in, I'll move over to panning. And panning for me is one of the things that really brings a lot of these clips to life. Because everything is recorded in mono and not stereo, we have to create that stereo environment. So if the rider is on the left side of the frame, we wanna pan that audio more to the left versus the right speaker so that you can actually feel that 3D space that, the, that we're trying to create for viewers. And so we can take a look um, at this first clip, actually. It's a really good one to show it. I'll just play it through first. So you can see that rider is coming from the left side of the frame and moving across to the right, and then they're moving slightly back towards the left side again. And so if we look at these two clips here, I can go to, I can right click and go to show keyframes here, go to panner, go to balance. We've got two clips stacked up here just to make that audio a little bit thicker. And you can see what that panning is doing. So when the rider is way out of frame, you can reference up here in the effects control, we're at negative 73 for the panner. So this is far, far left. When you're negative, it's in the left channel. When you're positive, you're in the right channel. And when it's at zero, it's right in the center. But you can see as he approaches screen, it's moving closer and closer. And here we go, he's on screen. Here, when somebody's right at the edge of the screen, I generally will put my pan around 30-ish, whether it's minus or positive, depending on the side of the screen. And then when they are moving to the middle, they're gonna be at zero, basically. And then as they're moving to the far side of the screen, they're again around 30. And then we're bringing it back to the middle here. So we're going back to right around there, he's at four. And so that's making that sound sweep through that 3D space and really making it feel um, like a believable sound that actually originates from the bike versus just sort of sitting in the middle of the soundscape. And this varies depending on the type of clip that you have, how much you might need to do this, but pretty much every clip in the sequence has some kind of panning applied to it to make it feel real. Now after panning, the one other thing that I don't always do to a clip, but often will do is use a low pass filter, sort of a, a quick and dirty way of getting at EQing. So you can EQ a clip and adjust the highs and the lows and the mids to make that sound feel appropriate. Maybe you wanna remove some wind by cutting out some of the low end or whatever it might be. That's, that's kind of making that clip sound good overall. But if we wanna think about it from an animating that sound point of view, we can use something like a low pass to really easily uh, represent a sound getting closer or further to the camera. So as something is further from, from where you're standing, you tend to lose the higher frequencies of that sound. And a low pass filter is specifically for this purpose. Whatever frequency point you set, it cuts off everything above that point and lets all the lower sounds pass through. In this case, when the rider is fairly close to the camera, you can see that I've got my cutoff set to 12,000 hertz approximately. And as the rider is moving further away from the camera, now I'm down to almost 9,000 hertz. And that's just removing some of that high end and it creates the illusion to our brain because it, it interprets sound in this way that we're moving further from that source. So a combination of low pass and volume moves us further away from our audio source and just makes that sound appear more believable. And in particular, this is important with that on bike audio because that, that microphone is not moving further from the bike at any point in time. So it's really important to create that feeling of distance from the rider. Beyond that, the, the main things that I do to my audio to process them is I'll, I'll put a compressor on all my channels. In this case, I use the tube model compressor and I just like to use the voice thickener. It, it's a really basic compression and it will take all the high points in your clip and smush them down so they're closer to the quieter parts. And this allows you to bring the entire audio clip to a higher volume level without causing clipping to happen. So I apply this, this, this basic preset to all my different channels of audio. And I also apply a studio reverb to my master channel. And the studio reverb helps sort of bring all those sounds and fuzz them out, make them feel like they're in the same environment, um, make them bounce off each other a little bit, basically. And so I use a mastering reverb. It's a very uh, delicate reverb. You're not gonna hear it a lot, but it adds just a tiny little bit. And that's the thing with sound. A little bit 
in a lot of different places kind of comes together to make something that feels rich. And, and if you don't do any of these things, it's, it's not necessarily something you'll notice, but if you do them all and you compare the two side by side, you'll really see the difference. But in their small, minute pieces, you might not actually notice. And that's, that's kind of what we want with sound. We won't, don't want to go over the top. We try to just do very gentle uh, shifts of things to make it feel natural. After I've got that studio reverb on there, I also put on this tube compressor um, on this as well, and I just do a light master. And again, that's kind of just squishing everything together, put it in the same environment, basically. Keeps it all feeling like it's, it's all happening and is actually real. The one other thing that you'll notice in here is I have this big long track at the bottom. This track is just a forest ambient sound, so I'll play it here. So that forest ambience is just what's filling in the space when there's pauses between the different sounds or kind of just puts everything into the same environment. Just like all these other things, we're trying to just create a rich environment. So this is just a basic one. I think I got this from Epidemic Sound and it has nothing really going on. It's just a very gentle wind sort of sound. And that fits in the entire mix at a very low volume level. It's a bit like room tone, essentially. If you're shooting an interview, you want that room tone to make your cuts flow seamlessly together. This is sort of room tone for mountain biking and it works pretty well, I think. But that's really all there is to the sound end of this. It took a lot of work. You know, each, each step of this process is probably between four and eight hours of work, you know, from the volume stuff to the panning. It takes a lot of time to put all those keyframes in. But what you're doing is not necessarily complicated. It's just time consuming. <laughs> so that's sound. Let's jump over to the color grading section of this. I've got two clips I've put aside that I think are a good example. One is a little bit simpler. One's a bit more complex. The first one we're going to take a look at is this shot here and then the second one is the opening shot this one here this is what we're trying to go for for this first shot this is what this clip looks like to begin with so you can kind of see the difference between those it's a pretty simple grade though when you're working on a color grade most important thing we want to do first is get the color correction dialed in and then from there we work on exposure and saturation and then i work on contrast and then it, you are kind of always working back and forth between those you know you adjust one thing you might need to go back and adjust some of the other settings they sort of bounce off each other a little bit once we have all of that done then we'll apply our creative part to this. And whether that's a LUT that you're using or something that you're doing on your own, we want to do that last. We want to get the entire sequence to feel approximately the same or at least have a flow to the way that the color works and then apply that creative look at the very end. With this clip, we'll jump over to the basic correction panel in Lumetri. And right off the bat, if I'm looking at Lumetri scopes, which is a big part of how I do this, I can see that my blue channel is really low in this this clip. It looks very yellow to me. It looks a bit green as well. My monitor is fairly accurate, so I get a pretty good uh, representation of what I'm going to have just using my eye, but I do rely on the scopes as well. We're going to just cool that down. We'll probably go to about negative 20. I find that's a good sort of starting place. I might even type that in. There's where it looks now. That's without. This kind of brings it more to where it feels like it was when I was out there. Now, the next thing that's pretty obvious with this is the clip is fairly dark. You can see everything here is sitting mostly below 60 IRE. So I want to bring that up a little bit. And there's different ways you can handle this. You can bring your exposure up. You could also bring up your whites and your highlights. Both are relatively similar. I will just start by bringing my exposure up just a hair. Um, yeah, we'll say about 0.5. That's probably pretty good. And then I'm gonna bring the highlights up a bit as well. And that's just going to expand this middle part of the curve up and just put a little bit more brightness in that whole image. Because when we add contrast, we're actually going to be bringing that brightness down again uh, because we're gonna thicken up the darker parts of that image. So that's, that's looking like a good place to start. Um, next, I like to add contrast. Some people will add contrast with the slider here. I prefer to do it from the curves panel. I think you get a little bit more control. I like to put a point here and a point here, and I'll pull the darker end of this down to darken parts of the, the, the darker parts of the image, and then I bring up the highlights here, and this little S curve here is creating our contrast. This is actually a little over the top, so we'll bring up that dark a little bit, so 
without the contrast applied, and then with the contrast applied. And then I feel like the image is just a little bit undersaturated, and that's because the profile I shoot with on the GH5, I've actually turned the saturation all the way down to negative five, so I can add that saturation in post to the degree that I want. Um, generally, I'll work around adding about 110-ish. That might be a little bit much for this. Maybe we'll go 108. That's looking pretty good. Um, now that I do that, I am seeing the image feels a bit green to me, a little overly green, and the scopes are kind of telling me that. You can see this red peak here and this green peak here. Um, let's try to add about five to the tint to bring that more in the magenta side. That's looking a little bit better to me. Here's where we're at now. If we turn off Lumetri and then we can turn that back on, it's looking pretty good. It's looking really close to what we had. So that's that's what I had, had originally graded the footage as, and that's where we're at now. So yeah, they're very, very close. Now the next step of this is to add that creative look to this. And that's what I do with this adjustment layer. So it's a separate layer. I don't touch the main Lumetri anymore. I just add it into this adjustment. And the only thing that I actually added to this creative look is under the creative tab, I did a sharpening of 10. And that's because I have sharpness turned down in the GH5. I like to add a little bit. And then the other thing I do is adjust my uh, color wheels and match. So you can see what this looks like without this turn turned on and with it turned on. So I've added a bit of blue into the image uh, through the midtones. I've kind of made it teal and the highlights I've sort of put in the blue and then the shadows I've pulled towards the greenish a little bit. And then on top of that, I have raised the midtones across the board and then I've lowered the highlights and then I'll drag this adjustment layer for my entire sequence. And then everything has that similar look. Now, the other way you could go about this is if you if you don't want to do this sort of manual grading process, you could go into creative and you could add your own LUT to that. But I find I, I prefer to do it myself, make it look exactly like I want and just kind of tinker with these a bit till it gets to, to the look that I want. There's no right or wrong way to do this necessarily, but I, I always try to go subtle with my, my creative looks because it, if you go too far, I find it's just over the top. And, and I knew what I wanted with this edit was something that was fairly natural feeling, but still a little bit moody, add some of that blue tones into the images. That's all there is with that particular shot. It's a pretty straightforward color grade. Now this next one is a little bit more complicated. This is the, the look that we got in the final film. And then this is where we're starting. So again, we're gonna go back to the basic tab and we're gonna start by adjusting our color temperature. I'm gonna pull up my scopes again so we can review that. We can see right away that the blue is quite prominent in this. It, you can see it here and you can see it in the scopes. So we're gonna go temperature of 20 probably. Yeah, bringing that up looks quite a bit more natural. Now the challenge with the shot, the reason it looks underexposed is because I was trying to keep the highlights retained up here. And in order to do that, I underexposed the foreground. So we're going to actually need to use a mask in order to expose this properly. But what we'll do first is we'll bring up the overall exposure of the foreground and make that kind of where we want it to be. So we'll probably go around there, bring our highlights up a little bit bring our whites up a little bit. I also think we need a bit more saturation in this. It's looking okay, maybe even a little bit more yellow. Yeah, that looks pretty good, but I don't love how the background is looking. I actually would like that to almost be a little bit more yellow, but I'm worried if we go too far. Yeah, that looks pretty good actually. So something like that. And then we'll jump over and we'll add our curve for adjusting the contrast. And our foreground is a little bit dark still, so I'm gonna bring up the shadows. Bring this down a bit more. See what that looks like with the rider in there. It's looking pretty good. I don't love the way these greens are looking. To me, they're looking too blue. They're kind of on the teal end. So what I use for that is the curve section and I'll adjust hue versus hue. And so you can pick this little eyedropper. You can click on what you want to adjust and it creates this little point. I usually find that these are a little bit too close. And so I move two points like that and then I'll take these ones out, just makes it affect a larger area. And then if I hold shift, it won't move the center point left to right. It'll just go up and down. And I'm just subtly looking to change that more towards yellow away from blue. So that's without and with. It's very subtle, but definitely noticeable on this end. Pretty happy with that. 
Overall, it looks pretty natural. Maybe bring a little bit more contrast into the low end of the image. Something like that. Okay, so now we want to address this sky up here being a bit overexposed um, and just not looking that great. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up to here and add another Lumetri color. And right after I do that, I click again and I like to rename it because it's really easy to get these mixed up. I'm going to call this background. And now we can basically adjust everything separately. But first we want to only isolate it to this area here. And so we jump over to our effects control. We'll go to our Lumetri color background and we're gonna click the pen tool here. And this will allow us to draw a mask. I'm gonna start at the beginning of my clip. And this is just gonna be rough. I'm just gonna put this mask in approximately where it should be. I would spend more time with this if it was the real deal. That's our rough mask there. And then because this shot is moving, we need to keyframe where this mask is, is at. So we'll turn on the keyframe thing here, and then we'll go to the end of this clip and turn that mask on again. You can see it's losing a little bit on this side. And so we'll just bring that over. If it was a more complicated move, this would probably take more time, but this should do pretty good job of staying with it now. The other thing I want to do is feather this mask, crank it up to say about 80, just so you can't see the edge so well. Okay, and so now you can see, like if I crank this, I'm just impacting that top part of the image, which is what we want to be able to do. We don't want to do this, but we want to be able to control that. And actually this is looking a little bit blue up here. So I'm going to go a little bit more to the yellow. That's probably too far. We're gonna bring the highlights down a bit. We're gonna bring the shadows down a bit just to make that forest a little bit darker. I'm actually gonna turn off the yellow. Eh, subtle, a little bit more subtle. It's minor, but it makes a difference. I want the focus here. I don't want the focus back here in this bright part. I want this to be the brighter part of the image. And then we can also now jump back to our other Lumetri, which is the sort of one that's covering the whole image, and we can continue to adjust things a little bit. So I'm gonna keep brightening up this foreground, make it more prominent. And then I can go back to my background and sort of balance, balance that out so it's not getting too blown out back there while I brighten up the front here. Uh, I'm gonna add a bit more contrast. In this case, I'm just gonna use this because it's just minor adjustment. Now I do wanna jump in here and see if I can get this soil to be a little bit more saturated. So I'm gonna go to the hue versus saturation, click on this, click on here, and we can try to bring that up a little bit. Again, we might need to widen this out so it impacts a larger area. It's subtle, but it does add a little bit more red to this because some of the soil on this trail is really red and I wanted to sort of communicate that right from the beginning because this soil here is not quite as red. So again, we can look at the whole clip with nothing done to it. That's what we started with. We added our base layer of adjustment and then we tweaked just the background to bring that more to where we wanted it to be. And then we can apply our creative LUT on top of that. And that's what we get. So this is what was in the film. This is where ours is. This one, this is probably a little bit too blue. And in that case, I might actually come in here and further crank up my temperature. Maybe make it more towards the green just by a little bit. You know, all this, this is all creative decisions at the end of the day. So. Part of why I had to grade this clip the way I did here, I believe, is because of the clips that it was leading into. And that's part of what you're doing with color grading, is you're telling a story with the color. It's not all just having to be exactly the same necessarily. You might need to be working with the clips that you have and making sure that that color is sort of weaving them into one another in a balanced way. I think that is about it in terms of color grading. I also had a few questions from Instagram folks asked, so let's just jump into those really quick here. 
Luke Nielsen is asking, do different lenses affect the color? And if so, does that make the editing process harder? So definitely different lenses will affect your color. And particularly, I find they impact the saturation of your image, as well as the white balance seems to be impacted a little bit by the lens that you're choosing. So I don't let it impact things too significantly on the day of shooting. I just try to make sure I'm nailing my white balance as much as possible. And then when I get into the edit, I know that I'm gonna have that latitude to push things around as needed. With this project, I shot in 400 megabits on the GH5, and so that gave me a lot of information to work with and allows me to push that color really far without the image falling apart. And that's just the best thing to do if you're finding that your different lenses are giving you a different image. But most of the time, I'm able to bring them into feeling like they're in the same, same world, basically. Next up, we've got one about sound here. How do you choose when you turn the sound down at the end of a clip? When I'm getting close to an actual cut happening, I'll usually have at least five to 10 frames of the next bit of audio starting to come in as that previous clip is ending. And so they're sort of crossing over each other. And this makes for a smoother cut. It also helps the brain get ready for what's coming next so that it's not being slammed with a new visual and a new sound all at once. Uh, but there's no one set way to do this. It, it really depends on the type of footage you're shooting, um, how that, that sound is coming together, but definitely fading out at the end of things is really good. And then I also will add the constant power effect to all of my clips, and I just do it for two frames, and this ensures that you're not going to get a little pop at the end of your audio. It'll just gently tuck the ends off so that you don't get that popping noise. I would love to know how you match colors from different cameras, the GH5, the DJI, GoPro. Uh, this is definitely a hard part of using multiple cameras. It's, it's much as possible. I like to shoot everything with the GH5. I have two drone shots in this video and they were so troublesome to get them to match. I find that my drone clips, um, we can take a look here, are often overly yellow. I shoot in D-Log and I set the white balance properly, but things are just really on the yellow side. And so you can see this one here, I actually had to crank down to negative 45 to get this to feel like it was in the same world. I'm still not 100% happy with how this clip graded next to the other footage. Um, when you compare them side by side, they look okay, but something just doesn't feel quite on point to me. One thing that you can do that, that might help with matching colors between the two is jumping into your curve section and you can go through and individually adjust the different colors to make them balance. And what can also help with that is if you jump into your clip and you can make a mask over say this section of green. So you're trying to match your green. And then let's jump to this clip here and we'll mask out some green in this one. Let's use this foreground here. So then we can go into our scopes and we can see where that green is falling on the scope here. And you can see it's leaning a little bit off of this line here towards teal, just slightly. And then if we go back to this clip here, we can see that this green is, is fairly accurate. So it's fairly close. These clips are matching on the green section. Now you might do that for a different color and find that they're, they're not matching each other and you'll need to make some adjustments. So the, yeah, that's the best advice I can really give is go color by color and work with your different curves to kind of bring them into a place of balance, but it can be tricky for sure. Did you have an idea of the color you wanted to achieve before or after filming? I didn't have a lot in mind in terms of color before filming. I did know I wanted it to be a fairly natural feeling edit. I didn't want to put a really heavy grade on this. Because it was fall, I was focusing on trying to get those fall colors into as many of the shots as possible. And then I figured out my creative styling once I was actually done with the whole project and getting into that color grading phase. That is it for this deep dive into changing seasons. This is probably the last video I will make about this project. If you've got other questions, feel free to drop them in the comments below or shoot me a DM on Instagram. Um, thank you again, everybody, for all of the kind words and just for following along with this video. I'm super pumped with how it came together and I'm glad I've been able to share the process with all of you. Until the next time, get out there, make something beautiful, and I will see you all soon. Peace.